Well, I live right by the ocean, and we started planning to um, to hunker down and stay at home. But by about three o'clock, the waves were coming over our 25-foot cliff, so we decided to evacuate. Went to a friend's house up in Orchid Land, which is you know away from the shore. When we went home in the morning, we were very fortunate to find I didn't have a lot of damage at my house, although some of my neighbors did. So I feel extremely lucky. And, uh, you know, that morning we thought, whew, it wasn't that big of a deal, but it wasn't until later in the day that we started seeing pictures from other neighborhoods and realizing the extent of the damage. And, um, you know, Pune was very strongly affected, even though there were no deaths or injuries from the hurricane itself. The eye seemed to hit lower Pune and bounce off it a couple of times. It kind of stalled out right there for maybe five or six hours. And it finally bounced around. When it came ashore, it was Pahala, and the, sh the, um, the storm had lost a lot of intensity by that time, so we only saw 40 mile an hour winds when it came to shore. However, Pune itself, especially Lower Pune, was hit by consistent 60 mile an hour winds while the storm was bouncing around offshore of us. What I've heard was there were 60 mile an hour winds on, and with 75 mile an hour gusts, but I don't know that for a fact. Yeah. Pune just by by luck got hit by the storm, got the direct hit, uh, which has really never happened before, at least in the historic times. And why there was so much damage, of course, is probably related to how many Albizia trees we have out there. Albizia trees have been recognized as a nuisance and a hazard, and particularly a potential hazard. But that night we realized that they are an actual hazard. And I feel um, more than 80, maybe 90 percent of the lingering damage from the storm was attributable to Albizia trees falling down on blocking roads, bringing power lines down, damaging houses and cars and water catchments and carports. All kinds of trees fell over, but Albizias were the largest ones and the most numerous ones and the most damage-causing ones. For myself and. Uh, a couple of people, uh, particularly Springer K from the Big Island Invasive Species Council and Flint Hughes from the U.S. Department of Forestry and Wildlife, the three of us spearheaded an Albizia uh, demonstration project last year. Uh, first, we brought together a lot of stakeholders to try to talk about um, Albizia in general, and we decided to concentrate on one pilot project down in Black Sand Subdivision, which started about a year ago and has been very successful. I can talk about what that project was, but we thought it would be a great way to show that Albizia can be controlled through partnerships involving the community and some agencies, that Albizia can be controlled, because I think in the past everybody just felt like it's impossible to fight against this tree. You just give up, we give up, and Albizia just take over forest after forest and neighborhood after neighborhood. They kind of crowd out everything else and end up creating hazards for the roads and the houses too. So we did start working on this in a slow and gradual sort of way last year. And um, now of course a lot of people recognize Albizia needs to be dealt with. And I have been working uh, together with uh, Senator Brian Schatz, Helco, as well as uh, state agencies and we're going to begin a more concerted effort to, to control Albizia in the future as a disaster preparedness uh, project. And I think that's going to allow some federal funds to flow into it, as well as state and county funds, as well as the utility. So we see those four people being major partners in uh, trying to prevent this particular disaster from happening again. Because the same hurricane in the same neighborhood would have been as I mentioned, about 80% less damage if it weren't for the Albizia trees. Now, Albizia tree is a very fast growing tree. Some people say it's the second fastest in the world. It was brought here on purpose um, because they thought it would be good for growing trees fast in certain forest areas. But of course, our understanding of invasive species and problematic species has is, is evolved a lot now. And Albizias cause a lot of problems because they are they they are so fast growing, but they are very weak wood, so their limbs fall very easily. They can be damaged by wind or just plain age. They grow and drop limbs routinely, and the way they grow, they tend to overhang places. So a lot of Albizias cause damage to neighbors' property. We have a lot of Albizia forests 
and uh, infestations really that are on land where the owner is absent, in absentee landowner lands. And that's where a lot of the problems came from. Yeah, typically, I mean, someone has a lot in Hawaii, they don't think about it from year to year, and meanwhile the albizia trees have grown to 50, 100 feet tall and are hanging over their neighbors. And it's caused a lot of problems. And we're going to have to find a way to address albizia on private property as well as albizia on, on public property. Did the county council pass a law that that have any teeth or uh, I think it has some teeth, but it hasn't been, uh, I don't know that it's been used much yet. They, I think it was uh, called Bill 64 at the time. It was a county law c relating to hazardous flora. Yeah. And it was really aimed at Albizia, and I, I appreciate Council Member Kern uh, champion this cause. And it was just one piece of the puzzle. It allowed people or the government to uh, require absentee landowners, require any landowners to remove hazardous albizias. And if they don't remove it, it provides opportunities to go onto the land, remove it, and bill the owner for the cost of removing it. Um, I'm not sure if that has been used or used very many times yet. I think we'll see a lot of lawsuits or damage assessments in the wake of the hurricane that will prompt a lot more people to take this issue seriously.